Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on the subject of the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about a lot of different messages on this subject. We talked about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, understanding that we get born again and we receive the Holy Spirit after we're born again. And then we get a prayer language where we can pray in tongues. And we also talked about how that the working of the Holy Spirit, seeing the principles from the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. We talked about hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit and being led by the Holy Spirit. We talked about the anointing of God that is in, to operate in your life and how to develop and see it come forth. We also talked about the rivers of living water that are to come out of the glorious church in these last days and how he wants to bring forth the mighty move of the Spirit of God in the church and he will do that through the Word of God in these last days before the end comes. Tonight we're going to talk further on the subject and talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. God wants us to understand the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We come to verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, meaning there's different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, the way it's ministered out, but the same Lord. There are differences of operations, or these are divine energies that are being operated, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. Notice the three, part, three persons of the Godhead are all involved. We see the Holy Spirit, same Spirit, operating these different gifts. We see the Lord Jesus, who's involved in the administration of them. And we see seem God is speaking about God the Father, where these divine operations or energies, spiritual energies, are coming from, who is accomplishing this. These nine gifts of the Spirit that there are, are the manifestation of the Spirit. Verse 7 says, The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Notice, it's given by God, and when it talks about it's given, this means you can't do anything to get it yourself because this is a passive voice verb. The passive voice means somebody else is acting upon the subject, which is talking about us. So the manifestation of the Spirit is given to us by the Holy Spirit. And notice it's given to every man. That means everyone who has the Holy Spirit within them has at least one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it's given to profit with all. It's not given for you. It's given for you to, to operate through you to minister to others. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are not to manifest something in your life. It's to be for you to be a vessel to flow through to minister to others. So it's going to profit with all. God gives you these gifts so that you can minister to the things that God wants to other people or to the entire body of Christ. And he begins to list out these gifts of the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 8, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing. Healing is actually plural in the Greek. Young's brings this out when he translates it correctly, healings, meaning there's different gifts of healing. There's gifts of healings. You might have a gift in one area, someone else might have a gift in another area. Different gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretation of tongues. Now these are the nine gifts of the Spirit. It says all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit. They're all working by the Holy Spirit. And notice, he's dividing to every man, each one of us, severally as he will. You might have one, you might have several, whatever it is, he's the one who divides it out. Notice it's as he wills, which means these are going to work only at the will of the Holy Spirit, not at your will. 
That's different from your faith. Your faith, you can work at your own will. You can pray at your own will. You can pray in tongues, your prayer language, your own will. This is talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can't make them work. This is the Holy Spirit operating through you as He wills. Now, when we talk about these particular gifts of the Spirit, they're in three categories. There are gifts that reveal something, there are gifts that do something, and there are gifts that say something. The ones that reveal something are called the revelation gifts. And there are three of those, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. The ones that do something are ones that perform something, and that's the gift of faith, the working of miracles, and the gifts of healings. The ones that say something are going to be spoken forth, and that's the gift of prophecy, then the diverse kinds of tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. In the Old Testament, seven of these were in operation. All the revelation gifts were, the power gifts were, only one of the vocal gifts were, which was the gift of prophecy. But tongues and interpretation is only that which is new to the New Testament because this comes once you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you where the tongues will come from the Holy Spirit within you and then the interpretation is that which is to come forth showing forth what has been said when you spoke forth in this gift of tongues. Now, let's give definitions of these for a moment and we're going to be going through these. First of all, the word of wisdom. Notice each of these in the word of knowledge, it's not giving you all wisdom or giving you all knowledge or thinking that this causes you to have knowledge or wisdom of whatever situation is. No, it's a specific word of knowledge and a specific word of wisdom. This is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit. It's not something you knew, not something you gained from wisdom from the word or knowledge from the word. It is supernatural. The word of wisdom is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit concerning the divine purpose in the mind and the will of God, what his purpose is, what he wants to bring forth, and it deals with things in the future. All prophecies are essentially words of wisdom, things that are spoken, what God purposes to bring forth in the future, and he will, of course, perform these things. So a word of wisdom is dealing with a future thing. The word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit of certain facts that are present now or in the past in the mind of God and it's concerning people or places or things. Otherwise, this is things that are already in existence or were in existence in the past. And we'll be giving examples of these as we go through this series. The word of knowledge, again, is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit of certain facts, things that are known now or in the past. Discerning of spirits, many people have thought it gives discernment in the realm of the spirit. It's not. Discerning of spirit is a supernatural insight into the spirit world where you can either see or hear as well as to discern things in the realm of the spirit. Many people see angels. Angels, seeing angels would be a discerning of spirits where you're able to see in the realm of the spirit. Sometimes people hear them. We've had people here report that they've heard of angels singing. And they have heard that while we were praising and worshiping the Lord as well as seeing angels. That again is part of the discerning of spirits. They're hearing in the realm of the spirit. Also, it is the means to be able to discern what spirits, seeing what spirits, or knowing what spirits are operating in a person. Again, you are discerning and seeing, hearing, perceiving spirits in the realm of the spirit that are in operation. These are revelation gifts. Now, if you are a prophet and you have a prophet's ministry, you probably would have most of the, all, probably all three of these gifts in operation, at least two of them or more, in order to operate as a prophet. But if you have any of these in operation, that doesn't mean you're a prophet. Somebody thinks, some people might think I have a word of knowledge in operation. That makes me a prophet. No, it doesn't. A prophet is a particular office that God has called a person to with a ministry gift, which is different from a spiritual gift. We're talking about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts 
are can be operating in a person even though they don't have a particular call of a, a office uh, that God has put them to. So word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, they're revelation gifts that reveal something. Then we have the gifts that are power gifts that do something. The gift of faith, which is a special supernatural faith. It's a faith beyond your faith by the Holy Spirit, enabling one to expect, sustain, or receive a miracle. It's beyond your faith. It is a special faith, faith added to your faith, so to speak. The working of miracles is a supernatural intervention in the ordinary course of nature in temporarily altering, suspending, or controlling the laws of nature and doing powerful works in the Spirit by the Holy Spirit, but especially work altering, suspending, or controlling things. For instance, when the axe head and we'll give scriptures on these later, but just give a quick example. The axe head that would sunk to the bottom and he stuck the, you know, the tree in there and then it was made to float. Well, they don't, that doesn't happen normally, of course. That was suspending and altering the laws of nature and it caused it to come up to the top. That's just an example of a working of miracles. Actually, deliverance is involved in a working of miracles as well, of casting out demonic spirits where you're doing powerful works in the realm of the spirit. You can also, of course, do that with your faith because everybody can cast out demons, all believers, but there can be powerful operations of casting out demons and working of miracles. Then there's gifts of healings. Gifts of healings <coughs> are supernatural healing of disease without any natural mean, means. Normally these are instantaneous. Um, we see this in the Bible happening. Jesus especially, who had the spirit without measure, everything was operating in him. He had no hindrances, of course, no sin, no demons within him, and he saw instantaneous, miraculous works. These are gifts of healings. Normally, they are operating almost immediately, and they have nothing to do with any natural means. Then we come to the vocal gifts. The vocal gifts are those that say something. The gift of prophecy. That's not talking about prophesying things that are going to happen in the future. The gift of prophecy, the simple gift of prophecy, is simply a supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit given in a known tongue, your known tongue, without any human thinking. You didn't sit there and think this up ahead of time and plan on what you're saying. It is understood not only by the speaker, because you're speaking in a known language, but it's also understood by all those who are present in the church. The purpose of it, as you will see, 1 Corinthians 14.3 talks about it results in edification, exhortation, or also, and comfort. Comfort can also mean encouragement. Exhortation, edification, comfort, or encouraging you in some way. It doesn't have any revelation in it. Now, gifts can have more than one operating in a particular gift in going in operation at a particular time. For instance, you could be prophesying and in the midst of that a word of knowledge could come at the same time. As you're speaking something forth in prophecy, you could also have, have it mixed in with a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or maybe a gift of healing. These kind of things can operate together. Then the second one of the vocal gifts is the diverse kinds of tongues. This is a supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit of that which is an unknown tongue, something that you don't know, not, you're not speaking in your normal language, or language is never learned by the speaker and not understood by the speaker. And this is different from your prayer language of tongues. Remember we've talked about the difference between the prayer language and the gift of tongues. The prayer language everybody has once you have the Holy Spirit in you. You can pray in tongues at will. You can start or stop when you want. You can sing in tongues, as the Bible talks about, in worship unto God. While the gift of tongues is the different operation, it is coming from God through the person that is bringing a gift of tongues. The purpose of it, as you will see when we bring the scriptures, is a sign to the unbeliever in the midst. Normally, you don't see it in congregations where unbelievers are not there. There's no reason for it. It is a sign to the unbeliever that God is in their midst. Normally, what you see is prophecy coming forth in a known language because it's speaking things to every single one of us. Then the interpretation of tongues is a supernatural showing forth by the Holy Spirit 
of that which has been brought forth in tongues. It is an interpretation, not a translation. Now, some people think it's a translation of what you said. It's not. It's an interpretation. What I mean is this. You could have a short tongues, a gift of tongues, and then a long interpretation of it. Or you could have a long tongues and a short interpretation. It's not interpreting it word for word type of thing. Instead, it's an interpretation which is a showing forth, not a translation. And that's important to understand. It is a showing forth, an interpretation, not a translation, and it's without human thinking. Again, the only reason for the tongues and the interpret, <coughs> uh, gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues is if you have unbelievers in your midst, because it will be a sign unto them. You'll see all these things as we go through these scriptures. God wants us to understand that these gifts of the Spirit are to operate in our life. We come down to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. He says to covet earnestly the best gifts. And the best gift would be the one that's most advantageous and helpful at a particular time. We should covet these. You know, you're not supposed to covet anything in the Bible. Covetousness is evil, except this. This is one thing you're supposed to covet. And when it talks about coveting earnestly, this means that you're going to burn with zeal to desire for something. You're going to want, have strong desire for it. It's good to covet, to burn with zeal, to have a strong desire, tremendous earnest desire for the gifts of the Spirit to operate. Because God wants you to operate. In fact, this is something that's important if you're going to see them operate. When we see this world, this word uh, zelolo, which is this word translated covet earnestly, we actually see this is an imperative mood in the Greek. The tense voice and mood is important in what we look at to understand what's being said. It's an imperative mood. The imperative mood is a command. That means God is commanding every single one of us to covet earnestly, to desire strongly, to burn with zeal, strongly want to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation in our life. And this is going to be an ongoing thing, so you should have a strong desire to see this happen. If you don't have a strong desire to see it happen, will you see it happen? Probably not. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you're not going to want to engage in, in being used of the Holy Spirit, and you, why would he manifest himself through you unless you're a willing vessel and yielded to him and wanting to see this happen? So if you want to see the gifts of the Spirit, you need to be having a strong desire for it, and knowing this is a command from God unto you that you're going to be obedient to. And so also we see down in chapter 14, verse 1, follow after charity, which is love, and desire, this is the same word, the same word, say hello, to burn with zeal for spiritual gifts. And again, it's the same thing, imperative mood present tense. So God wants us to have a strong desire for the spiritual gifts to operate in our yeah. life. So you can be used of the Lord so he can flow through you to minister to others. So you can be speaking things that God wants or doing his mighty works or getting revelation of things that are important for you to, to for God to bring forth to minister to other people. And that's what he wants to do. But also notice he says rather that you may prophesy. Otherwise, this is a desire that everybody should have. At the same time, when it says may prophesy, it is conditional. You can't desire to prophesy and then God's automatically going to give it to you. It is a conditional statement, meaning if he decides to give you that gift. This is the subjunctive mood, which is a conditional statement. That's why it says that you may continually prophesy. Prophecy is a good a gift that's important because it brings spiritual edification. We'll be talking about that later, but here it gives you the simple uh, what uh, definition of what pro uh, prophecy does. He that prophesies speaks unto men to edification, to exhortation, and to comfort, or this also refers to encouragement, encouraging you. So words that come forth that are exhorting you, that are edifying you, that are encouraging you, all are going to be good things that God brings forth through prophecy, and he wants us to do it. Now, some people have thought that 
they got to come to some super spiritual status or something before they can operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not so. Just as we grow up in things in the Word and we come to the place of some level of maturity and knowledge and acting on the Word, that's important to function in a lot of things, but not with this. We see it in Acts 19. Acts 19, this is where Paul came to find some disciples at Ephesus. And remember, he said to them in verse 2, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They had not received the Holy Spirit. They were only born again at that point. They said, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They'd only been born again. Well, down in verse 6 then, Paul ministered the Holy Spirit to them. When Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. That's the receiving of the Holy Spirit into them. And then what happened? They got their prayer language because they spake with tongues, which is really referring to the fact that they were speaking with tongues on an ongoing basis because this is an imperfect tense. The way that you would understand this is, it says the Holy Spirit came on and they were speaking with tongues in an ongoing basis from the past on, meaning that they got their prayer language and they were continuing to do it. And this is speaking from them continuing doing this. So this is something God wants you to have your prayer language. You just don't speak in tongues once and then not use it continually. He wants you to use it continually. And also though, notice what else? They prophesied. This gift was, came into them from the Holy Spirit. And the imperfect tense again, ongoing action in the past with continuing action, meaning they were prophesying. God wants us to understand that you can have a gift that comes into you at the time of when the Holy Spirit comes in, and you can start to prophesy if you have that particular gift. Otherwise, you don't have to come to some level of maturity. Don't think that. Don't believe that. If you want to seek after the gifts of the Holy Spirit and see what God has given you and see what, how he, to get them in operation, understanding them, of course, but also being zealous for them so that they will begin to operate in your life. Now, in this case, he laid his hands upon them. Spir spiritual gifts can be imparted by the laying on of hands, just as ministry gifts can also be imparted by laying on of hands. We see an example of that over in 1 Timothy chapter 4 in verse 14. Neglect not the gift that's in thee which was given thee by the prophecy with all the laying on of hands of the presbytery. This is Timothy who had a gift and he was a pastor so he had a gift that was placed in him for uh, a ministry gift. Now ministry gifts are different from spiritual gifts, remember. Spiritual gifts are well, the nine spiritual gifts that we can all have. The ministry gift would be something that would be a specific call that God would place upon your life. In fact, Timothy had this gift in him. In the second letter to Timothy, Paul's writing and he says in verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Apparently he wasn't really operating in what he should have been operating in and he was to stir it up and get operating in this. So, God wants us to operate in whatever gifts He's given it to us. If you have a ministry gift, He wants us to operate in it. If we have spiritual gifts, He wants us to operate in it as well. He just doesn't give you the gift and then you don't do anything with it. No, it's supposed to be functioning in an ongoing basis in your life. Now, if you have gifts of the Spirit that are placed in you, you're going to seek to see them come into operation and 1 Corinthians 14, 12 says, Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts. Again, that's got to be your attitude. You're going to be zealous, burning with zeal for them. I want to operate in these gifts of the Spirit. God sees your heart that you want, and you're seeking after Him and getting your position, self in a position. He'll, he'll, he'll take notice of that, and He'll begin to manifest those gifts that He's given you. Notice also what he says. For those who are operating in the gifts, he says, Seek that you may excel to the edifying of the, of the church. Because what are the gifts going to do? They're going to produce a building up of the church. Remember, they're not for you. They're for others. And so it's going to seek to excel. You're going to seek to excel to the edifying of the church. Otherwise, you want to do these, these, operate in these gifts in an excellent manner. You want to develop in them and carry out what God has for you. All these gifts are going to be operated with your faith by in the realm of the Spirit as you are functioning, doing what the Word says. 
They come from the Holy Spirit within you, and they will operate through you. You are simply a vessel for them to operate. To activate them that's in you, you need to, of course, first of all, have the desire to seek after them. God to bring revelation to you as you seek to him what gifts he's placed on the inside of you. But also, you need to see the gifts of the Spirit come forth because you're in a position to see the Holy Spirit operate in you. And how is that? By the filling of the Holy Spirit helps you to be in a position to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we taught on this, is the new birth when you get born again. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is the correct biblical term whereby the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. Those both are one-time things. The filling of the Holy Spirit is a continual thing that is to happen unto you ongoing, not just once. We understand this, and we'll just bring this out for you just to make sure you understand this. Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. When I put the cursor over the word filled, it is the word which is in the present tense, which means continuous, ongoing action. And it is an imperative mood, meaning it is a command. God is commanding us to be filled with the Spirit, but because it's present tense, that's significant. The present tense means continuous, or ongoing, repeated action. Literally, the way you would translate it is, be continuously being filled with the Spirit. So it's supposed to happen day after day after day, because the filling of the Holy Spirit brings the manifestation of the Holy Spirit's presence to accomplish things through you in your life, in you and through you. Now, how do we see this, can this filling of the Holy Spirit occur? Here's one of the ways. Verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Praise and worship brings a filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. Notice that, filling, that when you praise and worship, it has a dual effect, two effects. It is ministering, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, so you're ministering unto him, but it also has another effect. You're speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and it is bringing a filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. Another thing that we pointed out before, but we'll bring it out again, prayer brings a filling of the Holy Spirit. Remember, this is not the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in you. This is for someone who who has the Holy Spirit in him, who is bringing the manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit. For the, and what's the purpose of the filling? For the service of the Lord, to serve him. What are all the gifts of the Holy Spirit for? For the service of the Lord. So what's going to help to activate and bring into operation the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Getting filled up with the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord. Acts 4.31 when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. Notice, the filling of the Holy Spirit had an influence upon them for the service of the Lord. It influenced them because they spoke with boldness. And it talks about in verse 33, with great power gave the apostles witness of the, re of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them. So the filling of the Holy Spirit influenced them to speak forth boldly and they released the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace, the favor of God was upon them because they were manifesting the Holy Spirit to bring forth what he purposed. So to help activate the gifts of the Spirit, you want to be a praiser and a worshiper of God and be one who prays, especially praying in tongues is very powerful. Praying in tongues brings a filling of the Holy Spirit. And let's just talk about praying in tongues for a moment. Remember, you are, that once you have the Holy Spirit within you, you can pray in tongues at will. It is a spiritual prayer language. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. That's prayer language unto God. No man understands, howbeit in the Spirit he's speaking mysteries or divine secrets. The gift, the, the uh, gift of, when, when you're speaking in tongues, what this is doing is, is speaking unto God, and it has a dual effect. Not only speaking to God, prayer language, but just like in the same way in praise and worship, where you're praising and worshiping unto God, it has a dual effect, which we see in verse 4. 
He that speaks an unknown tongue edifieth himself. So it's ministering to himself at the same time. It is bringing a spiritual edification. Now, that's helping to put you in a place to be influenced by the Holy Spirit, a filling of the Holy Spirit for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit to operate through you. And it can help to get the, activate the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Remember, prophecy is going to edify the church while tongues edifies you, but it will edify you for the purpose of being a vessel to minister the gifts of the Spirit that God has placed in you to others. Now remember, as we mentioned, seven gifts are in the Old Testament, but the nine now are in the New Testament, which are the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Now let's begin to look at these and understand examples of them and see them in operation. First, we're going to begin to talk about these revelation gifts. Revelation gifts are, remember, gifts that are a supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit concerning the divine purpose in the mind and will of God. It's prophecy of future things that are going to happen. And here we see in Jude verse 14, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they've ungodly committed, and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is what's going to happen when he brings the judgment. This is a future event. He's prophesying, and that's when he comes back with a judgment. We are coming with him after the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we are with him and bringing his judgment. So this is a future event that's going to happen. All prophecies of future events that haven't happened, well, they actually are all are words of wisdom. If they get fulfilled, of course, when they're fulfilled, they're fulfilled. But they are words of wisdom because, again, it's not talking about wisdom from the Word. It's talking about God's wisdom of what is going to happen in the future, and he speaks it forth. Here's another example over in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, here in verse 12. Here's where God is speaking something when he's, of course, seeing the evilness of man, the wickedness of man, and he's going to do something about it. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Had that happened yet? No. Was that something that was going to happen? Yes. It was a word of wisdom. Anything that God has spoken that is going to happen in the future is a word of wisdom. That's also anybody that would ever speak a prophecy talking about with a word of wisdom in it about something that is going to come to pass, it's a word of wisdom and it's something that must come to pass if it's true. This is how you can tell whether someone's true or not. If what they say that's going to come to pass doesn't come to pass, and it says there's no light in them, they were false, and they spoke something that's not from the Lord. Of course, what did he do? He told them to make the ark so that then he would go, go into the ark and be protected. He gave them the directions of what he was doing. So he was speaking of this coming of the flood. So this is, again, a word of wisdom. And these things were in operation in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. Here we see in Genesis chapter 37, verse 5. And by the way, these words of wisdom can come in different ways, or just as any of them can. They can come, as far as a lot of things can come, initiated by maybe a dream or by a vision or by a word. There's lots of different ways that God can function. Here's a case where a word of wisdom actually came to him through a dream. He dreamed a dream. And he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. He said to them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. Lo, my sheave arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. Otherwise, they're going to bow down to him. That was a prophecy that what was going to happen. And it did happen. It happened when, after Joseph was in Egypt, and he was exalted, of course, to be the prime minister, and there was a famine, and they had to come in order to bow down before him to get uh, food for themselves when there was the great famine. His brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Which is what they understood. 
Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So this was a dream that was bringing revelation. Here's another one. He dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. That was all pointing towards the father and the mother and the eleven, eleven brothers all were going to make obeisance to him. He told it to his father and to his brethren. His father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother, that's the way they picked, understood it, and thy brethren <coughs> indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee in the earth? Again, had this happened yet? No, but did it happen? Yes, it did. His brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. If you ever have something that comes and you don't understand it, don't take the wrong attitude. This one, the brethren, they envied him. They were mad about it. That's the wrong thing. The father, who didn't understand it, <clears throat> he still, he observed, or means to watch the matter. He watched as Young's brings forth. He watched the matter to see whether it was going to come to pass. You just kind of lay things on the shelf if you don't understand something. But don't get an attitude about it. But, of course, you're going to check it out with the Lord about whether it's something that's true or not. But this is Joseph's dream that he had. This is a word of wisdom of something that was going to come to pass. We see another case over in Genesis chapter 40, verse 5. Here, this is where someone else had dreamed a dream, yet Joseph was the one who was going to interpret the dream. You may not have the actual dream itself, but you can have a word of wisdom to be able to interpret. And the interpretation is not you figuring out what you think it says. It's revelation by the Holy Spirit. You don't ever interpret something yourself. Well, I think that means such and such. People try to interpret dreams. There's even people who have written books and say, well, this always means this, and this always means this, and this always means this. It doesn't always mean the same thing. It can mean something different. You've got to get the, whole, the interpretation from the Holy Spirit not from trying to figure out what something always you think it means, or what, just because it meant something once doesn't mean it's going to mean that all the time. So they dreamed a dream, both of them. Each man is dreaming one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. Joseph came into them in the morning, looked upon them, behold, of course they were sad. And so he comes down here to verse 9, and here's the chief butler, told his dream to Joseph, said to him in my dream, behold, a vine was before me, in the vine were three branches. It was as though it was budded. Blossoms shot forth. The clusters there brought forth the ripe grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. She, now, you'd never figure this out by trying to figure out what it means about the branches. Well, Joseph got revelation, though, from God. Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. The interpretation is the showing forth of what God is saying in the Spirit, not a translation of it or you interpreting it in the natural, in the mind. No, this is spiritual. Everything will come by the Holy Spirit. The three branches are three days. Branches don't, always, don't normally mean that. Branches, you know, like in the New Testament, when it talks about us being a branch, it's referring to us, I'm not talking about days. That's why you can't just decide that, well, it meant this one place, so it must mean this, some other, you know, in another place. Don't make that mistake. A lot of people in the body of Christ have, and they got way off track in thinking they, they interpret dreams when they, or visions and when they haven't. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head, restore thy, the end of thy place. Thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into this hand, after the former manner, when thou wast his butler. Think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, make mention me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. And he tells about how he was stolen away and put in the dungeon wrongly. So the chief baker saw the interpretation was good. He said to Joseph, he says, well, I want to see what he'll say about my dream. I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket, there was all manner of baker meats for Pharaoh. The big birds that eat them out of the brass basket out of my, upon my head. And so you get, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In this case, both things happen to mean three days. You can only get the revelation from the Lord. Most people would think that, well, the th different things must mean different things. In this case, it didn't. You've got to, again, get spiritual revelation. The three baskets are three days. 
Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. And all these came to pass. One thing's for sure. If it's truly a revelation from God, it'll come to pass. If it's not a revelation from God that comes to pass, it wasn't truly from him. It was a false revelation. And we've seen lots of false prophetic things that have been spoken in the body of Christ saying that things were going to happen and they didn't happen. There's a problem. It came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday. He made a feast unto all his servants. He lifted up the head of the chief butler and the chief baker among his servants, restored the chief butler to his butlership again, gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand but hang the chief baker as, as Joseph had interpreted to them. So exactly what he said happened. Genesis chapter 41, we see another case. This is where Pharaoh had a dream. Again, this is a dream by somebody else, and then you may have the interpretation of it. This again will be a gift that God gives you, revelation gift by the Holy Spirit. So you might have the dream and the interpretation, or you might just have the interpretation of some other dream that somebody else might have. And so here it says how he stood by the river and came up out of the river, seven well-favored kind and fat flesh, and they were fed in the meadow. Seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill-favored, lean flesh, stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. Ill-favored and lean flesh can to eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. Of course, you're going to try to interpret that and figure that out yourself? No, you make a mistake. You've got to get revelation. He slept and dreamed the second time. And now he's got another one about the seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. He gave him two different dreams. Behold, seven thin ears blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. Seven ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke and behold, it was a dream. Of course, he tried to get the magicians, and they couldn't do anything for it. And so the chief butler says to Pharaoh, I do remember my faults this day. And he speaks here. He says, we dreamed a dream, and we, each man, according to the interpretation of the dream, there was with us a young man, a Hebrew servant, to the captain, the guard. We told him, he interpreted us our dreams. Each man, according to his dream, he did interpret. And it came to pass as he interpreted to us. So it was. Me he restored in my office, and him he hanged. So, of course, now he's calling for him to come and to bring this forth. So Pharaoh comes, Pharaoh say, or Joseph comes, and Pharaoh says, I've dreamed a dream, and there's none that can interpret it. And I've heard say of thee, thou can understand a dream to interpret it. Now, his response is right. Don't think that, oh, yeah, I can interpret that. That's the wrong thought. Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, it's not in me. It's God. God. Everything is God. Don't ever think if you doing it. You're going to get off track. You're going to have a, something wrong operating through you if it, you think it's you. Always know it's God. You've got to always be looking to him. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So Pharaoh says to him, he repeats this, this dream to him, of course, and shows him this. And then we come down to, he repeats this whole thing. And Joseph says to Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one, even though there were two. He says it's one. You'd never figure that out if you just tried to figure it out yourself. God has showed Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven good years, kind, or seven years, seven good years, seven years, dream is one. And he talks about the seven year, good years, and he talks about the seven years of famine. He says, the thing which I've spoken unto Pharaoh, what thing is about to do, he showed unto Pharaoh. Seven years of great plenty. And then he talks about, after that, that the famine will come. There'll be seven years of famine. So here, this is the revelation that he brings him. You have to get this from the Lord. But this was a word of knowledge, or excuse me, a word of wisdom of what was going to happen in the future. And also, he had a further revelation that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice because the things established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. And of course, that's exactly what happened. So again, you've got to get the revelation of it from the Lord. We see another word of wisdom, and God can speak things to you as a word of wisdom, showing you things that are going to come. Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. Angel Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. 
And Moses said, I'll not now turn, turn aside. See this great sight while the burn, bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. And he said, Moses, Moses, he said, here am I. And then he tells him to put off the shoes from his foot because he's on holy ground. So here he speaks to him several things. And he comes down here to verse 10. Now come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. That is a word of wisdom. It was the purpose in the mind of God of what he called him to do that he wanted him to fulfill and bring this forth. So he was speaking a word of wisdom that he was to deliver the Israelites from Egypt. So again, God's call, a call upon someone's life of what he has purposed for you to do would be like a word of wisdom of what the future is for you. It's not automatic. You're going to have to do things to see it happen. Things don't just automatically happen because something has been spoken over you. And we'll cover that a little bit later when we get over into the New Testament. So we see that, again, this is showing words of wisdom, something that was going to happen in the future. We say this, see, that we see one more we'll look at in the Old Testament, Judges chapter 6. Over in verse 7, came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet, someone who's going to speak of something that's going to happen. Unto the children of Israel, which said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, brought you forth out of the house of bondage. Those are statements of what happened in the past. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the hand of all that pressed you, drove them out from for you, gave you their land. I said, I am the Lord your God, fear not the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So that's just all, of course, just relating facts. There came an angel of the Lord and sat under the, the oak here, which was Oprah and pertained unto Joash the Abbas Bezerite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And here's where the angel of the Lord comes to him, and he speaks to them. He says, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And, of course, he's, he's saying, if the Lord be with us, why has all this befallen us? Where did all his miracles, which our father told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, and now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us in the hands of the Midianites? The Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might, thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, have not I sent thee. That is a directive to him, and it's a word of wisdom of what God was telling him he was going to do which was to save them from the hand of the Midianites. It came to pass. It was conditional upon him being obedient to do what had to happen. So it does not automatic. You must understand all words of wisdom are words that are either directives of what God wants you to do or prophecies of something that is going to happen in the past, in the future. Uh, mess messianic prophecies, all the prophecies in the Bible about Jesus before he came on the scene were words of wisdom. All the prophecies that haven't come to pass are words of wisdom as well. Now, let's go over to the New Testament and we'll see examples. And you'll see how this works. <coughs> over in, first of all, in Acts chapter 11, verse 28, speaks of a prophet's name was Agabus. There stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world. This was a famine that would come, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So he spoke a word, a prophecy, a word of wisdom that something was going to happen. And even here it shows that it was confirmed it came to pass in those days. <clears throat> then the disciples, every man according to his ability, sent it, determined to send relief unto the brethren of Judea. And so they, they sent it to them. Because of this particular prophecy, they knew what was going to be happening. We see also another prophecy by this man over in chapter 21, verse 10. And there's different ways. Remember, there's different administrations of how things can come forth in different ways. This is why you just want to, whatever the Holy Spirit brings forth, you want to be operating according to what he brings. Verse 10, as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. This is the same guy. And when he was come out unto us, he took Paul's girdle. Now here the Holy Spirit had him take something. He took a girdle. 
bound his own hands and feet, acted it out kind of like, and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And we heard these things, both we and they at that place besought him not to go to Jerusalem. Of course, it's exactly what happened. It happened and it came to pass. It was a prophecy of a future thing that came to pass. God wants us to understand that he will give you words about things that will come to pass. Remember what we saw before in John chapter 16 when we were talking about what the Holy Spirit does. John 16 verse 13. When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He'll not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear. Remember, he relays things. That shall he speak. But notice also, he will show you things to come. That's word of wisdom. That's future things. So the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. Words of wisdom will come forth and bring revelation to you. We see another case over in Acts chapter 23, verse 11. We'll go to verse 10. There was a great dissension here about Paul. They were coming against Paul. In verse 11, it says, The night following the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Otherwise, that was a further word, a word of wisdom. You're going to be going to Rome, too. And it came to pass, of course. And the way he ended up going to Rome was what the devil, of course, tried to wipe them all out with a storm. We see over in Acts chapter 7 when they were going forth in the, the boat to go over there. This was revelation that he got from, that Paul got from the Lord. He said this, Sirs, talking to the leader of the, of the head of the ship, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lady in the ship, but also of our lives. So he's telling them, he's picking this up of what was going to happen if they took this voyage at this time. Well, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than the things that were spoken by Paul, and he decided he was going to go anyway. Because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part devised, devised to depart thence also, if by any means that they might attain to Phoenice, or there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. So this wind started to blow softly at first, but then all of a sudden this tempestuous wind shows up when they're in the midst of this voyage. So they're looking now, and we come down to verse 20, and <laughs> everything was a mess. The third day they had to cast out with their own hands the tackle of the ship because the ship was about being wiped out. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. The things that Paul had spoken were coming to pass. After long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me. You should have listened to what I said before. And not have loose from Crete, and to have gained this harm and, and, and to have gained this harm and loss. Look what you've done, because you didn't listen. Now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. How did he know this? For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. He belongs to God. Now remember, words of wisdom or any kind of words can come in a variety of ways. It might come directly. It might come from a vision. It might come from a dream. Here it's coming from an angel, an angel speaking. And so this angel stood by him this night saying, Fear not, Paul, for thou hast brought, must be brought before Caesar. Remember, he said he's going to go to Rome. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. So, of course, they went forth, and they saw all these things happen. He, he told them to stay in the ship. Verse 31, he said to the centurions, except you abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. He's telling them again what's going to happen. This time, they listened to him, which was right. They all stayed in there. And then what was the end result of all this? All the things he said came to pass. The soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose, commanded they could not, that they could swim, should, that could swim, should cast themselves first in the sea and then get to the land. 
and the rest, some on board, some on broken ships, pieces of the ship. So it came to pass that they all, they escaped all safe to the land, which is what he said. Everybody's still going to be safe, even though the whole place was broken up. So this shows you the fact that God can speak a lot of different ways. One thing, if something's truly of the Lord, you better hearken to it. These guys didn't hearken to it. They ended up having all this damage. They lost all the ship. They lost all these things. But at the same time, he heard from him, the Lord through an angel, spoke to him, and gave him revelation of what they were to do. This time they listened to him so that they didn't, they were all safe and they didn't get wiped out. Now, another thing that we need to know is that words of wisdom, which are something that God says is going to happen, doesn't mean they aren't conditional and can't be changed. Here's an example. Second Kings, chapter 20, verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Well, that's a word of wisdom. You're going to die. Get your house in order. God is saying, you are going to die. He turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked with thee before thee in truth with a perfect heart, have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. came to pass after Isaiah was gone out in the middle court. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, came to him, saying, Tell again, turn again, and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I've seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day, you'll go up into the house of the Lord, told him what to do, and I'll add 15, uh, unto thy days 15 years, I'll deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. I'll defend the city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. So he said he was going to go up there, he's going to heal him, and he would go up there, and then he would add 15 years to him, which of course came to pass. So that meant that God, what God said could be changed. When, and that's the case. When he prayed and declared these things, he changed his mind. So not everything is automatic that it's going to happen. It can be changed. Here's another case where we see this happening in the Old Testament. It's in Jonah. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah was told, remember, to go and to preach the gospel at Nineveh, and he disobeyed. Well, Jonah 3, verse 1, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Rise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. This is after he'd come out of the, being in the fish's belly, and he got delivered out of it. So, he arose, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Nineveh was an exceeding great city, the three days' journey, began to enter in the city a day's journey, and he said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, that's what God told him to speak. So that was the word of the Lord. That was a word of wisdom. This is going to happen to you. You're going to be overthrown in 40 days. The people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth, and the greatest of them even to the least of them. The word came into the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes, which means repentance. He decreed it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Everybody had to fast, including all the animals. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Otherwise, they had to repent and deal with all their sinful, evil ways. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger? that we perish not. And what happened? God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil. That means things can be changed if you meet the conditions and come to repentance that he had said that he would do to him, and he did it not. So that means that some prophecies about things that are going to happen are conditional. Even regarding seeing things come to pass in your own life. 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 18. Timothy had some prophecies about him, apparently things that were going to come, to, that God had purpose for him. That would be a word of wisdom. 
Look what he says in verse 18. This charge I committed to thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Otherwise, you're going to have to war a good warfare to see these things come to pass. It doesn't mean it's going to automatically come to pass just because it's been spoken. You're going to have to war a good warfare to see things come to pass, or it may be some obedience that you need to carry out in order to see things come to pass. So anything that God has, even if he's spoken anything to you directly about, uh, in a sense of a word of wisdom of what he wants to accomplish, if you don't meet the conditions, it's not necessarily going to come to pass. Here's a good example as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. For a great door ineffectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. The door is open. Does that mean no problem, smooth sailing? No. Many adversaries. He had to overcome at the same time because the adversaries could have blocked him. In fact, they did at times. Remember in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, it talks about how I wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered us. He didn't overcome that adversaries. Later he did overcome adversaries that were arrayed against him, trying to stop him. You have to overcome them. Things don't just automatically happen, and that is so important. Now, God will speak to you in a lot of different ways. He can speak to you various ways. Let's look over in Acts chapter 16. Again, showing them a word of wisdom, what God's purpose was, directing them what they were supposed to do. In Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Here it says, when they went through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden, forbidden by the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. He said, don't do that. He st stopped them from going forth. They were come to miss you. They say to, they uh, were testing if they were supposed to go to Bithynia. The suffer Spirit suffered them not. He said, no. See, the Holy Spirit wants to lead you step by step in everything you do. Passing by Mysia, they came to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia, prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. After he'd seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. And so they went there, and they ended up coming to Philippi, where they were able to preach the gospel there. So here again, this God will speak different ways. In this particular case, as you see, there was a vision that was given. God could give you a vision. He could give you a dream. There's lots of different ways that he can speak to you. In fact, in John chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 8, talking about how the Holy Spirit can manifest. Verse 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. Things of the Spirit, you may not know where it's coming from. But nonetheless, it's coming and to show you what to do. Remember how God can speak to you. One of the ways that we saw when we were talking about this, Isaiah chapter 30, over in verse 21. Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn the right hand and you turn the left. Otherwise, it just seems like it comes out of nowhere. This word came like out of nowhere from behind me. You know, that's the way things will happen. And also, it could either also be like a still small voice, as we saw. We talked about that in uh, First Kings chapter 19, over in verse 11, where it speaks here about how the Lord was. He wasn't in the earthquake. He, he wasn't in the he wasn't in the wind, he wasn't in the earthquake, and he wasn't in the fire. But then when he heard after the fire a still, small voice, that was the Lord. There's lots of ways he can speak to you. You want to know how he speaks to us. That's why we brought those messages in the past. But then also you want to be listening because the Holy Spirit can be bringing words of wisdom, things in the future of what he wants to bring forth in order to accomplish what he purposes. Now, there's another one we want to look at over in Acts. And this one actually combines, in this particular passage, word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. You see both of these operating together here. And you can see the difference here. This is where Saul got converted. Saul got converted on the way to 
Damascus, and so he couldn't see. Remember, he was blind. They, somebody had to lead him by the hand, brought him to Damascus. He's three days without sight. He didn't eat or drink, so he's fasting. A certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision. Now he's coming to him in a vision. Now remember what a word of wisdom is, is a supernatural revelation of something in the mind of God that's going to happen, a future event. Well, what's the word of knowledge? The word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit of certain facts that are present now or in the past that in the mind of God about a person or a place or a thing. So a word of knowledge is something that's presently so. A word of wisdom is something that's to happen in the future. And you see both of them here at this point. So he said to the, him in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. The Lord said to him, Arise, go into the street that's called Straight, inquire on the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. He tells him where he's at, so what is that? That's going to be a word of knowledge. It's a fact that was in existence. He's now in the, in the street straight. He's in this house of Judas. And he tells him who to specifically call for. Of course, that was Saul who was, he knew he was coming to try to destroy them all. He didn't know he'd gotten converted at that point. And then he also tells him what he will be doing. He says, what he's doing, he says he prayeth. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and put his hands on him that he might receive his sight. So here now, this is relating a vision he had and also declaring what Ananias was to do, which is a word of wisdom of what he was to bring forth. He's coming to lay his hands upon him that he might receive his sight. Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he's done to the saints at Jerusalem. Here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. He knew all about this guy. The Lord said, Go thy way. He's a chosen vessel unto me. Now that is a word of knowledge, essentially, of what God's attitude was. But the next statement is a word of wisdom of what God's plan and purpose was for Saul, who would later became Paul to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. He's saying, this is what the call of God is on this guy's life. He's going to go and he's going to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. So that's a word of wisdom of what the purpose of God was. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So he goes his way, enters in the house, puts his hands on him, and says, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way that thou camest, has sent me. So he's speaking about this word of knowledge that he got, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost, which is the word of wisdom of what we were supposed to do, lay his hands on him, get his sight restored, and be filled with the Holy Ghost for what? For the purpose of going forth and preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. So here you see a combination of both of these in operation. Some that word, of, word of wisdom, and word of knowledge that will be in operation. God wants us to want to seek after these things. Remember the word of knowledge. We'll look at a couple things on this before we stop for tonight. It's not a gift of knowledge. Some people call these things a gift of wisdom or a gift of knowledge. It's not. It's a word of knowledge, not a, a gift as such. It's not insight, remember, from walking with God. It's not insight from the word. It is something that not that you figured out in your mind. No, it has nothing to do with that whatsoever. It is revelation from the Lord that you have no idea about. And God wants us to understand that all these things are supernatural. They're all coming from the Holy Spirit without a thought. You know, I've seen people before. We had, remember one particular person in Ohio that decided they were going to try to speak some things to a person because they wanted them to come to repentance that was in the church because they had some problems. And so they started to prophesy things that they knew about the person and telling them what they were, like exhorting them what they were supposed to do. <laughs> they, were out in the, they were in the flesh. They were thinking this up in their mind what they wanted to do and we figured, you know, picked that up that it was not of the Lord, confronted them and 
put a stop to that immediately, said, you're in the flesh, you don't sit there and use the platform of prophecy to speak some kind of things, in the, like a word of knowledge of what you know has happened in their life and a word of wisdom of what they're supposed to do when it's just coming from you trying to tell them what to do. <laughs> you don't ever do that. You don't speak anything that you know. You only speak things that God wants you to speak. You cannot, otherwise you'll be in the flesh doing things. God wants us to, to operate in these things. They're po po powerful. <clears throat> Here's a case of a word of knowledge that we'll look at. The word of knowledge is very powerful. They're all powerful gifts. 2 Kings <coughs> chapter 5. This is talking about Naaman. We talked about Naaman, how he had gotten uh, healed of the leprosy. We come down to verse 20. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman, this Syrian, in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I'll run after him and take somewhat of him. Otherwise, Elisha didn't want any money from him. Remember that uh, he, he wanted to give him some money, uh, back here. I urged him to take it, but he refused. Naaman, he wanted to give him something, but he, he refused to take it. So, Gehazi says, well, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to go after him and get the money. Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lights down from the chariot to meet him, and he said, is all well? He said, all's well. My master has sent me. A lie. Saying, behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. Give me some money and give me some clothes. <laughs> yeah. Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. So he gives him more. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver and two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bare them before him. When he comes to the tower, he took them to the hand and bestowed them in the house. They let the men go, and they departed. So here he is. He's got this. He went and stood before his master. He hides him in his house. See? And Elisha says to him, Where comest thou, Gehazi? Now this is a prophet that has a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom and operation, and he thinks he's not going to figure this one out. He said, Thy servant went no thither. I didn't go anywhere. You know, lying through his teeth. He said unto him, What not mine heart with thee? When the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee, is it time to receive money, to receive garments, olive yards, vineyards, sheep, oxen, men servants, and maid servants? The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and to thy seed forever. <laughs> he was cursed, and it cursed his entire household. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. It was a word of knowledge. He saw what this guy had done. And when he saw what he'd done, that was the end for him. You know, words of knowledge can catch people in lies or make sure, you know, to, to know what's right and what's wrong. And when people tell you stuff, in this case, he was lying, of course. Here's another case. 2 Kings 6, verse 9. Here is where... The king of Syria was warring against Israel, and they were knowing all of his plans. <laughs> he took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. The man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for hither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place where the man of God told him, and warned him of, and saved himself there not once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and called the servants, and said to him, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Who's telling the plans? <laughs> there wasn't anybody telling the plans in the natural. One of the servants says, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that's in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Otherwise, God was revealing to Elisha, by a word of knowledge, the things that he was speaking, all of his plans, that what he had. So a word of knowledge can speak about the enemy's plans and the things that he was trying to do, of course, and of course they got him. Of course, then he says, go and spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. Well, if he knew your plans in your bedchamber, you think he's going to know the next plan, you're trying to come after him and catch, get him? <laughs> he's going to know every move you make. 
Of course, that didn't work. And so he sent the horses thither, and great hosts came by night, compassed the city about. And so the, when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone for, the host compassed the city with the horses and chariots, and they said, My master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? He said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they would be with them. What's he talking about? Not only did this guy have the word of knowledge and word of wisdom in operating him, he had the discerning of spirits. And we'll be talking about that, but you're going to see this. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see in the realm of the spirit. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. He saw him. Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. That's all the angels. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Here we see Revelation. He had discerning of spirits in operation. He saw what the, the, all these angels that were there. didn't matter what was coming. And then, of course, he spoke a miraculous work, a working of miracles that caused the, them to be smit with blindness. So he had multiple gifts that were on operation at the same time. The gifts of the Spirit are tremendously powerful. We should be seeking to want to see what gifts God has placed within us, and okay, maybe he wants to impart some other gifts to us. Certainly, God wants you to want to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. So we've opened it up and talked about this tonight. We're going to be going through this. And certainly, this is something that you are, and I are commanded to seek after, remember. We're to be zealous for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, one thing for sure, you can, pride will shut them and stop them from operating, thinking that you will stop them operating, wanting them so you'll, people will look up to you or whatever, will stop them from operating. Don't do it. You've got to have total humility, total yieldingness to the Lord. You don't want anybody to see you. You only want people to see the Lord operating. That's it. You have that kind of motivation, total humility, and you want to be used of the Lord totally. That's your total motivation you'll be in a good position for God to operate and to bring revelation of these and begin to operate them in your life. Praise God. Say this to me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are the manifestation of the Holy Spirit that are given to every man. They're given to me to profit with all. I thank you for revealing to me what gifts of the Holy Spirit you have placed in my life, I will be zealous seeking after them to see them operate in my life. I thank you for revealing to me what gifts I have and thank you for helping me to recognize them and to do what is necessary to see them come in operation by being filled with the Holy Spirit through praise and worship and pray in tongues and obeying the command of burning with zeal for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to operate in my life. I thank you for bringing forth the gifts that you have for me to operate in for the profiting of others. I thank you for accomplishing this I will do what your word says, and I thank you that you will reveal to me these gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for helping me to operate in them. Thank you. I will excel in their operation, and I will see you use me to profit others in the service of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We've opened up this tonight on Sunday, we'll be going back over just the basic definitions of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and operating and, and sharing more on these and getting specifically into them. And I'll also be going through them all and talking about how to especially helping to activate them in your life. Praise God. Father, thank you for all that you're bringing forth continually in this Holy Spirit series of messages. Thank you, Father, for us, each one of us really seeking you and having the desire that's got this burning with zeal to see these gifts be in operation. 
Thank you for revealing them. Thank you for beginning to operate them in, my, in our lives. And we thank you for everything will glorify the Lord and accomplish the great work of ministering to others effectively with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for bringing forth much fruit from this. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord.